Shall we close the door, please? Good morning, everyone, and you are welcome to the first meeting of second part of this administration. Can I just start by saying I'm honored to be re-elected as chair again. Uh, I'd like to use this opportunity to thank all the councillors who have uh, elected me. Same time, I would like to uh, thank Councillor Aidan Smith, who was part of this uh, panel in the last two years for his contribution and scrutiny. Thank you very much. At the same time, I'd like to thank all officers for your hard work, your due diligence, and, you know, Kenneth and his team for uh, a good performance so far, which we'll be discussing in closed door. But uh, we believe that we are moving forward. Equally, I would like to welcome Councillor Simon Pierce for joining this, uh, uh, this panel. So I go now to inform everybody that this uh, meeting is being recorded and it will be posted on the YouTube. Uh, you are in charge of your microphone. Please switch it on when you are speaking and switch it off when you are finished. Can I remind everybody that uh, your phone should be on silent or off? At the same time, I think around 11 o'clock, there will be fire drill, so be aware. We have officers here who will direct us to the necessary place. Apology for absence. Yes, uh, we have apologies for one. <coughs> Sorry, Chair. We have apologies um, from the training provider at Hymans. Um, he, can't, he couldn't make it because of a transport issue, but Kenny has happily to step in to deliver that training. Also, we have apologies from Councillor Joe van der Boek and Councillor Pierce. I believe there's no other apologies. Um, any urgent business? Nothing to my knowledge. Declaration of interest. Has any member have anything to declare? So let me and you. So, Councillor Gardner, have you got any declaration? No? Minutes of um, the last meeting, which I think uh, you want to say something about um, uh, page 16 and 17. Yeah? Yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Um, just on page 15, we had the financial report in Council FRC Stewardship Code. Uh, report for 2023. I'd just like to give a brief update to members to say we have been successful in becoming a stewardship of the a signatory of that. So it's a really good moment for both the panel and the board to achieve that, and it demonstrates strong um, stewardship and governance of the fund. Thank you very much. That's another success story. Well done, all the team. And I go to item number five. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to uh, show that I've read them. Um, so under item seven, uh, stewardship report, um, on the last paragraph in page 16, something I raised at the last meeting, it should, in response, in res it, it should read in response to questions, not in response to questions. And, um, and it shouldn't be audit members to be on the board, it should be former audit partners to be on the board. That was the point that was um, being made. Is that noted? If that could be changed, yeah. Have you sure. got any other question? Uh, can you note that, please? Thank you. Item number five, to note the pension fund audit plan, 
which is called Audit Strategy Memorandum. Uh, this will be presented by Julian. Thank you, Julian. Uh, th thank you, Chair. I'll just pass it over to uh, Mazar, who's taken over from Grant Thornton, if you'd like to present. One working? Yeah. Um, I'll take the report as read, and I'm sure it's relatively similar to the audit plans you would have received from Grant Thornton, but I will just highlight a few key areas that I think you should be aware of, um, and a couple of, um, I suppose, updates and changes that uh, I need to also let you know about. But let me first and foremost just um, introduce you to sort of myself and Forvis Mazar. So, um, we are now the second largest provider of external audit services to local government. So as well as yourself, uh, Pension Fund and Council, I'm also the partner in charge of the audits for five other London boroughs and their pension funds. And I also actually am the partner for the Greater Manchester Pension Fund as well. Um, I've been doing public sector audit for my whole career, which is now in its 30, 30th year. So um, hopefully I can bring that experience to bear in terms of your audit. In terms of the team that I've presented in the report, slight, slight change to that since I think we actually drafted this back in May. Uh, so I've got Stuart Frith listed there as the manager, but that now is gonna be Tom Greensill, who uh, will be the audit manager for both the pension fund and the council. Um, We've got some significant risks in there that, again, I'm sure you'll recognise from predecessor auditors. Um, management override of control is a standard kind of audit risk across all uh, entities that we audit. And obviously for a pension fund, the sort of the biggest judgment and estimate that there is in your account is the level three investments that you hold, which I think is about 230 odd million. Um, and we obviously carry out what we call special audit procedures around those more difficult to measure um, investments but again that's pretty well that is exactly the same as what Grant Thornton would have identified in the past. Um, in the report I do highlight some consultations that government had started again at the time of draft, pre to drafting this report. Um, since then the election has obviously got in the way. Uh, we're still awaiting the outcome of those consultations particularly as they relate to the backlog of work that I'm sure you're aware of, uh, not, not for this council, thankfully, but other councils that um, we deal with. Um, and we anticipate that to hopefully get resolved by um, end of July, early August, in terms of what the government's, the new government's um, output is on that consultation. Um, I have included a timetable that we've agreed with the council in terms of delivery of the pension fund and the council audit, and you'll see that is to start in earnest. Uh, I think we actually start in September, Due to complete the work through to November and then go through completion procedures to sign off in, in January 2025. And then the only other thing I just wanted to highlight was on materiality, which I think is your page 50 and 51. I've just kind of run through the numbers to your actual accounts that you've obviously now published. So the materiality level for the pension fund will be 16.9 million, performance materiality of 11.8 million, and trivial at 500. Uh, thousand. So uh, 16.9 is obviously the overall materiality that we set for the pension fund. Um, other than that, Chair, I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, uh, thank you. I will come to you, Councillor Gardner. You did not say anything about your fees? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've got 91,239 compared with the former which is 22,000. What, what is special? Why are you doing special that uh, will cost us that much, much money? Thank you. So, so the fees that are reflected there are the fees that have been set by Public Sector Audit Appointments Limited. So if you remember, you opted in to a national procurement to procure your external audit service. They, they're the ones who set the fee. The fee is obviously based on the procurement process that they ran and the prices that firms who were successful in that procurement um, bid for, essentially. But the fee is set by PSA. I don't, I don't set the fee. Uh, 
So they set the fee, we collect it on their behalf, uh, and actually they retain a certain percentage of that fee and, and we retain a certain percentage. So, so the fee that's written there is the public sector audit appointments fee and not, not, I, not the fee that I would have set. Councillor Gardner. Um, thank you very much. Um, I asked this uh, question of Tom uh, when he came to the audit panel uh, last week, Suresh, and um, it concerns uh, the, the, the Forvers um, Mazar's uh, performance as a PSAA uh, auditor. Um, I've had experience of Grant Thornton in this council where they've uh, always been at the top of the game. You know, they're, 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 they've performed very well in terms of timeliness uh, and, and indeed the quality of their work. Um, but I wondered where, uh, and I know I chair another audit committee and we've had EY who've been quite off the other end of the scale, very, very slow, uh, constant change in personnel, lack of capacity and so forth. I wondered where Mazars were in terms of your capacity, your tooling up, and your ability to meet this timescale, which still doesn't meet the statutory deadline. Thank you. And uh, Tom did, did let me know that you'd asked that question, so hopefully I've, become, I've come for, uh, forewarned about that. But, uh, so in terms of where we are uh, as a firm, so on the quality side, we perform very well. So in the last uh, FRC report on the quality of our work in local audits, uh, we were one of only few firms who uh, received um, sort of uh, only limited improvements on our audits, which if you, if you know the limited improvement is essentially is meets, meets the standard. So, um, so that was very um, a, a good performance for us. So on the quality side, and you can talk to um, other London boroughs that we audit about how we get, actually go about the audit, I think we're in a good place. In terms of where we are with the backlog of work and what that means for Greenwich, uh, in London, of the um, prior to picking up Greenwich and Ealing, so you're the two new councils that we audit under the new contract. Uh, we had five London boroughs, and of those five, three we had completed up to date, and two uh, there were certain issues. So nationally, I think as a firm, we are about 50% complete on 22, 23 audits, um, and so we're kind of in amongst the pack in terms of the other firms. Um, but across London, I've, in, I've instigated a regular meeting with the Section 151 officers to talk about scheduling and timing, but also the expectations on, on the councils themselves to be able to deliver the things that we need to be able to deliver our audit effectively, because it's a, it's a two-way process. We can't do our job effectively if we don't get the right information, if we don't get the right responses. So, so the timetable that you've got in there is part of a wider timetable to deliver all the London Borough audits within the the revised, I suppose, timetable that we were expecting government to publish. So I'm, I'm pretty confident we've got capacity to deliver what we need to deliver by the schedule that we've agreed with our 151 officers. And uh, obviously, if things change with, with Greenwich, we'll do that through the 151 officer and report back to you as a committee. Are there any other questions? Yes, Councillor Gardner. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, uh, thank you, Suresh. So I just, obviously, you're a new um, audit firm. I just wondered if you could reassure us in terms of um, your onboarding and familiarisation uh, with, um, uh, with the council and the pension fund, uh, pension fund obviously in this case, um, and, and whether you've had a handover meeting and notes with Grant Thornton. Yes, we actually started the handover process back in, I want to say, October last year. Um, and we've had a, a numerous, well, we've had a couple of meetings with Grant Thornton. We've carried out a review of their most recently completed file in terms of your 22-23 audit, and that went really smoothly. So we've got all the assurances that we are required and we want to obtain from Grant Thornton. Similarly with the council, we've had numerous uh, introductory meetings again before Christmas with um, senior officers and we've actually completed all our planning to support the plan that you've got in for you there. So we're actually, again, we're in a good place in terms of the, uh, the first year audit and the things that you'd expect us to be able to do. Are there any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Are members happy to uh, adopt this uh, plan? Thank you, you can leave now if you wish to, or if you want to stay behind, you're welcome.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Item number six, pension panel business plan for 2024 and 2025. Uh, can I hand over to Julian to run us through this, the plan? And I think before we, before we start, this plan does not include the away day. So can you run us through that? Thank you, Chair. Um, this panel would have received the draft business plan at the last meeting. This um, report just updates the business plan with dates now. Um, as you said, we don't have the away day included in the meeting, but if panel would like um, a strategic away day for this year, we can always put that uh, together from offices. Um, don't have anything else to add here other than we possibly will have maybe one or two further meetings this is to do with, we're looking at two new mandates in the London Civ, so it might be better to have separate meetings if we're gonna select new managers, but I'll confirm those dates well in advance. Are you happy with that plan, Councillor Gardner? Um, thank you, I, I do have one or two questions actually, but I just wondered what the changes were since the draft that we saw. Thanks. Um, there was no change in terms of agenda movement, just the dates has been added onto the plan. Um, thanks. I mean, I, I've got some generic comments, but they might be more appropriate to raise them elsewhere, Chair. Um, I wondered, I think it's page 33, looking at my notes, um, about there's a, there's a table of our UK investments which it says TBC, 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 all the way through. And I, just, I was just interested, obviously, given both the uh, direction of travel of the previous government and uh, reinforced very much and given added vigor by the new Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, to um, ensure we're maximizing the um, investment um, of pension funds in, 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 in the UK. Um, it, it, quite relevant, that table and I wondered what the, the data was in terms of how much across the different asset classes that we've got invested in the UK effectively. Uh, I thought, I, I think I've got page 33 on the business plan. Go ahead if you have the answer. Yeah, Th th thanks you, Councillor Gardner. Um, yeah, no, absolutely right. So this was a, a new requirement under the guidance uh, presumed by the SAB board for this year. And um, one of the things we're trying to get information is through our managers, try to report this. So while it's to be see here, we're hoping before we hand this over to the auditor to publish, we'll have the information available as part of the audit process. Yeah, go ahead, right. go ahead. I'm sorry, because these are probably questions I could have asked last time. Um, but I was looking at the costs of, the, um, of, 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 of our pensions function and um, over four million. And I just wondered, I wondered why the cost of management fees were pretty flat. They've gone down, they're going up again, um, given 
that more money is being invested through ELSIV, which one of the purposes of ELSIV should be to pool not just the funds, but actually reduce the overall management fees, because if each borough is having to pay um, investment advisors and so forth, um, then um, it's obviously a lot more than it being done at an ELSIF level, uh, although the overall sums. There should be some synergies uh, from the use of ELSIF, and as our holding going through ELSIF has increased, thus the funds we pay on management should be, as a portion of the overall pension fund, should be reducing. Um, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Just, just to mention two things there, you're absolutely right. As we move to more pooling, we should see more savings. However, I think the ELSIF savings will come through further down the line because it's not just us moving to ELSIF, it's other borrowers moving to ELSIF, and by critical mass, we should get discounts from our managers. Um, so we should see, over time, we should see a reduction in fees. I think also the other things adding to the increase in fees is the AUM. So as the fund grows in size, most of the fees is benchmarked against the AUM. So as that increase, we'll see fees goes in line with that, yeah. Are there any other questions? Are members happy to agree the pension fund panel business plan for 2024-25? Agreed. Agreed. Item number seven, that is the draft pension fund annual report and statement of accounts. We are here to review and provide commentary on the pension fund annual reports. And I ask Julian again to run this through. I think, Kenneth, we have to say something there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll pick it up first and then I'll pass it over to Kenny just to talk about their um, increase in the value. So, members are asked to review and provide commentary on the Pension Fund Annual Report 2324, which also includes the draft pension fund statements of accounts. The next step will be for us to process um, the actual statements of accounts and hand it over to the auditors for testing. Panel will receive the audit finance report and recommendation possibly December or late March. Um, I'd just like to take you through the two main statements um, on page 307 of the pack. So this is effectively the profit and loss accounts. This is presents item of income and expenditure for the fund relating to investment transaction and those that relate to members. The fund value increased by 106 million over the course of the year compared to a decrease of 51 million for 22-23 financial year. In terms of dealing with members, both years result in a net withdrawal. So for 22-23, for we saw 7 million, and then for 23-24, we saw 15 million. This means payments of benefits outweigh contributions. This is a result of the fund maturing. The fund is monitoring this and aligning the position of the fund to ensure cash is available to pay benefits when needed. If I can just take you through the second statement, which is on the next page, 308. So this is the net asset statement, effectively a balance sheet this presents the asset of the fund represented by investment portfolio adjusted for working capital. So the distribution between the different asset class is shown on the face of the accounts. The net asset of the fund has increased from 1.584 billion to 1.69 billion. The performance of individual fund was mixed, although overall performance was positive. Um, I'll pass over to Kenny, maybe if you want to talk through just briefly around that one of six performance. Yep, thanks, I think, Julian. Kenny, if you can let us know the performance for the last quarter as well, that would be great. Thanks. Yep, thank you. Um, yeah, as, as Julian said, the, the fund has added 106 million pounds over the year to March 2024. Um, and that equates to a return of about 8%. Uh, that, that return 
um, is largely driven by the return from your equity investments and it reflects the sort of diversified uh, portfolio of equities that you hold with a, a, a range of uh, invested across a range of sectors and geographies in, in order to de deliver that return. Um, the, the most recent quarter, the quor first quarter of 2024, um, you actually added £54 million pounds in that quarter alone. Um, and the fund has further improved since then, uh, adding about another £20 million pounds since the end of, end of March. So it's obviously pleasing to see that the, the assets under management are, are growing. Um, thank you, Chair. Happy to take any questions on this report. Question? Yes. Thank, thank you very much and thank you for the report and congratulations on the overall um, performance. That's brilliant. Um, so I wondered, is it too early to say how our overall performance and that uh, growth from 1.58 to 1.69, uh, how, how that benchmarks against other pension funds, uh, particularly London ones, obviously, that would be uh, useful to know if presumably uh, we're talking to uh, talking to them. Um, and I'm also just slightly interested that the um, both on the contribution side and on the pension side, the quantum seems to have increased slightly more than the rate of inflation or the agreed um, pensioning, the, what was the, the, the automatic pension increase. And, and wonder, does that represent, um, does that represent, certainly the member contributions have increased a lot more than the pay settlement. Um, and uh, so, and, and not, not so much employer contributions. Um, does that represent um, an increase in overall membership uh, for, the, uh, for the year? I think uh, Kelly will be the right person to answer that question. Okay. Um, th thank you, Councillor Gardner. Yeah. Um, as, you, as you point out, the employee contributions will stay in line as 18.5, they, they'll pay roughly. Uh, for the member contribution, I'll probably need to drill down a bit more why that is. Um, we'll expect, obviously, pay increase to be a factor, but as the other factor will be if there's an increase in membership. I think membership just level out this year. I don't think there was a massive increase. So we mm -hmm. can have a look and see if there's more higher earners came into the fund. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's one of the reasons, but I'll come back to you with that. Actually, it's the opposite. It's more the low earners. The pay increase where it has been a lump sum figure yeah. has increased the lower end of the pay scale by over 10, 12, 13 yeah. percent. But the actual bandings of the pension contribution bandings have only changed by whatever CPI was, so 6.7% 6, 6 last year. Um, therefore, we've had more people falling into a higher banding, having to pay more oh, in pension contributions. Yeah, yeah understood. Um, and benchmarking, do we know about benchmarking, Julian, against other performance of other funds? Yes, I, I can come back to the um, panel with a report, so we can look at the neighbouring boroughs and wider, um, as the published accounts will have that information available here. So at the next meeting, Chair. Yeah. Will it be okay if you send that to, by email to members beforehand so that you know, we won't be looking into that again? Uh, can I just say, Ken and Steam, thank you and well done for the brilliant performance, uh, which is uh, something encouraging. However, I'm just thinking, do you think as of now, because we don't know what is happening in America in November, do you think we should be looking to Russia now to invest? Well, goodness, there's, there's a lot happening in the world, isn't there, just now? Um, I think in terms of Russia, um, I mean, the conflict continues. Um, we don't have any sort of end in sight on that one. And, and for the time being, um, there's an embargo on investing in, in Russian stocks. Um, now, we all hope that the conflict comes to an end sooner rather than later, and, and, and in, in those circumstances, we can revisit the investment case for, for Russia at that time. I think there's a long way to go, though, um, not just in terms of the conflict itself, but um, 
the aftermath, the reparations that Russia might need to, to pay um, for, for, for the war. Um, obviously need to see how it develops, but I think, I think it's, it's possibly too early to be, to be looking at that in any, any great detail. We can rely on Fidelity, who manage your emerging market equities. They, they are the experts in this area, so I'm sure if they see an opportunity and they're allowed to, that they would go back into the Russian market, but it, it feels, feels a while off before we could, we could do that. Okay, can I frame the questions on another way? What effect will change of uh, precedent in America by November have on our portfolio? Okay, of course, we, we, we had very interesting news yesterday with uh, President Biden deciding not to, to run for, for election in, in, in November. Um, and Kamala Harris w is likely to be the, the, the candidate. So um, I think that shifts the dial a little. It appears that Trump is still favorite to become president, but um, maybe slightly um, slightly more in favor of the, of the Democrats than, than, than um, we were before the, before the weekend. Um, with a, a Trump presidency likely, um, I mean, it does create quite a bit of uncertainty, a bit of unpredictability, I think it's safe to say. Um, against that backdrop, I think it's, it's very important that you maintain a diversified portfolio. You can't cover all the risks, can't cover all the bases. Um, in light of what might happen in future. So it's important that you maintain the diversified portfolio that you have, and that includes investing across different asset classes, as you're doing, and also, po possibly more importantly, across different regions, making sure you spread the risk um, so that you're not overly exposed to one particular market or sector. Thank you. The effect of a uh, mass IT outage on Friday what effect or implication would that have on our portfolio? How secure do you think our managers are? Yeah, goodness. Um, I mean, surprisingly, it didn't have much of an impact on markets. Um, even, even CrowdStrike, the company at the center of this, um, I think their stock price fell by, I'll say, only 11%. You know, something as dramatic as that you might have expected a much um, more significant fall in, in that company's share price, but it, it didn't happen. Um, and if anything, the commentary that we picked up towards the end of last week was that CrowdStrike might actually be a buy option, you know? Um, so really quite um, strange the way that, that panned out in terms of markets. So I think, I think we can take some consolation from the fact that markets weren't adversely impacted by what was really quite a big um, IT issue last week. Um, I mean, there are questions that need to be posed and answered, and those are around the concentration of risks on a, a small number of companies. You know, how reliant we are on Microsoft, how reliant we are on um, IT companies that support the updates that my, Microsoft push out. So there might be some ramifications coming out of that. You know, if you're reviewing your own risk register, you might think about, well, are we, are we too reliant on, a, on a, one individual company? And I would imagine other organizations are, are, are thinking along those lines as, as well. So. No immediate impact or no material impact on markets as far as we could see, um, but I would imagine there's a, there's a broader question that needs to be answered there about how organisations manage the risks and avoid that concentration or reliance on, on, on a, a small number of, of IT providers. Yes, can I go? Gartner? Yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to make absolutely clear uh, that we should in no way be investing in Russia. <laughs> and not only is it illegal, um, but, but um, assets, any, any investments are not safe um, and, and, and could easily be um, taken uh, by the government or they could be, um, you know, sub, you know, subject to huge risks. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I think it will be a long, long time uh, before we're comfortable investing in Russia. Um, but what I would um, want to ask is, is our exposure to the US far too high across our portfolio? That would certainly be my view, that we're far too US-centric um, and should we not be rebalancing that with more uh, European and UK investments and more, um, you know, global investments in the Far East, Australia, and so forth, Latin America and things. Um, I, I just wonder whether our balance is wrong 
uh, and therefore were too exposed to vicissitudes of the uh, US market. No, thank you, and uh, yeah, I agree with your comments about, about Russia. Um, in terms of exposure to the, the US, um, yeah, I mean, it, if, you're, if you're to invest in global equity markets, you track the index, then you've got an immediate exposure to a very small number of companies in the big tech stocks. They've done very, very well recently, but will that last forever? And therefore, should we be looking to moderate that exposure is, is, is the question. Um, I think from the fund's perspective, you've arguably got a more diversified strategy than some other pension schemes. Um, you've got a greater exposure to the UK, for example, than, than other LDPS funds might have. Um, currently, you've got a greater exposure to emerging markets. Um, you've also got a diversified global equity strategy um, because you split your investment across two different funds. One fund is called is what we call a market cap, and that does have that concentration of exposure in these tech stocks. But you've also got um, another global equity fund that invests in a different style, and it's less exposed to those tech stocks. Um, so you're absolutely right. I think that there are dangers in being overly exposed to the US, um, but from the fund's perspective, I think you have, on the face of it, looks like quite a well-diversified portfolio at, at, at this point in time. Now, in terms of returns, that possibly hasn't helped the fund, because if you wanted to maximise returns, you would have been ch chasing these tech stocks over the last wee while. Um, so in terms of performance, um, it, it's probably counted, ag counted, you ag counted against you having that more diversified portfolio but that's there to provide protection for you in the event of a downturn that might come in the future. Are there any other questions? No. Are members happy to note this report? Agreed. The rest of the meeting will be closed door because it contains information which is exempt from the provision of Local Government Act of 1972, Schedule 12A, because it discloses information relating to financial or business affairs of any particular person, including the authority holding this information. Therefore, we'll be going into closed session. Can you please turn off the... YouTube, please. Thank you.